Welcome. I'm Sam Mangelko, and I serve as the president of the Southern California chapter of EERI. The chapter is very proud to bring you today's program, Perspectives on Building an Earthquake Resilient Southern California. Throughout the past year, the EERI SoCal board and I have been heavily focused on reinvigorating the chapter in a way that brings true value to our membership. And this webinar represents the first of many events and activities the board will be facilitating. We're moving towards several goals for the chapter, such as hosting several events each year, including educational and social programs for chapter members, reaching out to and engaging local university chapters to bring research and practice closer together and encourage students to continue with EERI after graduation, providing our membership opportunities to get involved in making Southern California a more earthquake resilient place to live and work, and providing members the opportunity to get involved with EERI and help forward EERI's mission. Our next event will likely be a virtual meet and greet session with the board and chapter members and we'll discuss plans for the chapter in 2021 and give membership a chance to share ideas for what type of events and programs they would like to see the chapter. Please keep an eye out for event announcements from us. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to honor the passing of a beloved and remarkable member of our community, Charles Terry Dooley. Terry lived a full life of service to his family, community, and the fields of construction and civil engineering. In his early days, he demonstrated his commitment to civil rights activism by working with the Fair Housing Council of the San Fernando Valley and participating in the Montgomery, Alabama March from Selma, led by Martin Luther King Jr. Later, Terry made major contributions to advancing seismic resilience in California before it was ever called resilience. He helped pioneer the earliest ductile reinforced concrete moment frames in Los Angeles. He spent 21 years with Morley Builders in Santa Monica working on benchmark projects like the base isolation of Rockwell Building 80 in Seal Beach, UCLA Powell Library seismic upgrade, and his seminal project, the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in downtown LA. Before his time at Morley, he was involved in constructing bridges in California and the Pacific Northwest and high voltage transmission lines in Arizona. Terry also built bridges between people. In 2002, he founded the ACE Mentor Program in Southern California, which brought architecture, construction, and engineering concepts to over 1,500 young minds in 27 high schools throughout the region. ACE Mentor encourages students to pursue careers in these fields by showing them hands on how we work every day. Terry was an honorary member of SEAC, a fellow of ASCE, and in 2017 was named winner of prestigious Legacy Award from ENR California. An EERI member since 1991, Terry was a very strong supporter of the Southern California chapter, and we appreciate that. He was an inspiration and friend to many, and he will be deeply missed. Welcome again to Perspectives on Building an Earthquake Resilient Southern California. Today's program will provide insights into the concept of functional recovery as a crucial component of earthquake resilience in Southern California communities. Resilience depends not only on designing buildings to withstand earthquakes, but moving beyond that to ensure that communities withstand earthquakes. That means the systems, entities, buildings, and infrastructure we rely on every day must be brought to a higher seismic standard than they've met before one that provides not only life safety, but functionality after an earthquake. Functional recovery is the topic of David Bonowitz's 2020 EERI Distinguished Lecture. And today we'll build on that work to explore how Southern, California's, Southern California communities will achieve this enhanced level of preparedness, what has been done so far and how best to proceed. We'll use portions of the 2018 Resilient Los Angeles Report as a touchstone for our discussion. Our panelists, Susan Dowdy, Henry Burton, and Craig Davis, will give us perspectives from their respective areas of expertise. And I expect we'll have a lively and provocative discussion that will open up to questions from the audience. I encourage everyone to submit questions they may have that will explain to help, and we will explain the process for asking questions in just a moment. I would like to take a minute to express a special thanks to our brilliant moderator, Christine Goulet, Christine is the Executive Director for Applied Science at the Southern California Earthquake Center at USC. As a geotechnical engineer, her primary areas of interest lie in ground motion modeling, 
and seismic hazard quantifications for engineering applications. Christine has been instrumental in helping organize today's event. Thank you so much for your help, Christine, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sam. So, um, give me one second so I can share the screen again. Good. So, welcome again, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here uh, on this webinar uh, entitled Perspectives on Building an Earthquake Resilient Southern California. We have three main goals for this uh, webinar. The first one is to inform through presentations uh, on resilience and functional re recovery. And again, this is anchored uh, around the the resilient Los Angeles document. However, these concepts apply pretty much everywhere and we want them to be focused in Southern California. Our second goal is to bring up discussions and have our panel uh, debate and maybe argue about certain aspects and, and bring this topic forward. You will all be invited to submit questions to be participating in your own way to these discussions. And finally, the third objective here is to really spur us all into action. So this webinar is a starting point uh, for getting uh, more of us involved in uh, resilience activities through the ERI uh, Southern California chapter. So. If you're not already a member, uh, please join the chapter and make sure to join our mailing list. We have a link at the end of this presentation. So uh, I will go over briefly some uh, meeting logistics. Uh, I'll introduce our presenters. Then we have about 30 minutes of presentations. And as you can see, uh, all the rest of the, the discussion, uh, all the rest of the webinar is focused on a panel discussion. So and we'll, <clears throat> we'll finish with a few closing comments. So this web webinar is being recorded. It's uh, intended to last 90 minutes. So for those who are with us live, this is going to close at 12.30. Um, we invite you to fill out the post-webinar survey. This is really useful so we can improve <laughs> in the future. You will receive that after the webinar. PDH forms, the survey, and the recording will be made available in the following few days. So webinar controls, uh, by default in the go, uh, go to uh, meeting, uh, you should have all your control panels to the right of your screen. And uh, that's where you can adjust your audio and video and so on uh, so that you can customize the views uh, to your liking. The important part here for your participation is the question panel that you see right here. So all those different sub panels are are expandable and collapsible using the left arrow here and that's where you would click to enter your question. We ask you to note who you're asking the question to so that we can follow through. We will monitor all the questions and triage them throughout uh, the webinar and those that are uh, more uh, clarification questions will be answered right after the presentations, but we intend to keep the more general questions for the panel discussion. So again, this is the part where you can all contribute. Um, for the rest, everybody is muted except the presenters. Another note on the uh, webinar controls here, the video options, you can decide to see different people. <laughs> If you want to see us uh, gesticulate as we animate our presentations, uh, you can control that with the video controls. So um, I think that's that's it for that. So now I want to go ahead and introduce our, our presenters and speakers. Um, it's a very short introduction. They have a little bit more complete bios in the invite to this webinar. The first one is David Bonowitz. He's a structural engineer in San Francisco and he's the 2020 ERI Distinguished Lecturer. He's been an ERI member for 26 years. He's a consultant to San Francisco's Earthquake Resilience Program and has been active on resilience committees for FEMA, NIST, the National Institute, uh, Institute of Building Sciences and Structural Engineer Association, uh, both at the, the National Council level and also SEAC in California. His presentation, is uh, on functional recovery, what it means to design for community resilience. And again, he's going to anchor that in how it's addressed uh, in the resilient LA document. Uh, so he's going to talk for 15 minutes. 
And our uh, remaining three speakers are, have been invited to make brief remarks, five minutes each. It doesn't at all reflect <laughs> their importance, but we ask them to be very focused on, on specific aspects of uh, resilience and recovery. Uh, the next presenter is, go is going to be uh, Henry Burton, is also a structural engineer. He is an associate professor at the Engelkirk and the Engelkirk President Chair in Structural Engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Los Angeles. His teaching and research are focused, are focused on nonlinear structural analysis, performance-based design, and urban resilience. He's going to talk about the Los Angeles Soft Story Ordinance for uh, wood frame buildings. Next, we have uh, Susan Dottie, another structural engineer. <laughs> she is a regional manager in the Government Relations Department at the International Code Council. She has over 35 years of 35 years of experience in the development and application of building code provisions. And prior to her current position, Susan <clears throat> was the vice president of SK Gosh Associate, a seismic and building code consulting firm. Her title is, um, is functional recovery from the building code perspective. Finally, uh, not the last, not least, uh, Craig Davis, a geotechnical engineer this time. <laughs> He's a consultant uh, and recently retired after 31 and a half years at the LA Department of Water and Power, where he served as their geotechnical, seismic, and resilience manager. He's the founding chairperson of ASC's Infrastructure Resilience Division, and he won numerous awards, uh, but I'll focus on the two that are active this year and next year. Uh, he received in 2020 the ASC Charles, Charles Martin Duke Lifeline Earthquake Engineering Award, and he's going to be our 2021 ERI Distinguished Lecturer. He's also the conference co-chair of the upcoming Lifelines 2122 San Fernando Earthquake Conference. It was originally planned for February 2021. It's now been postponed to February 2022. Uh, I think we still hope to host that locally in Los Angeles, uh, uh, but it has been postponed to February 22. Uh, please put that on your calendars. So at this point, I think uh, we're going to start with the, the juice and uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And David, you can take it away. Can you? I think you're muted. I can't hear you. Now it's unmuted. Thank you. Okay. So sorry, I had to wait for the, the screen share. And now my presentation, off we go. So thank you so much to ERI and to the Southern California chapter for inviting me. Uh, as uh, both Sam and Christine mentioned, uh, this is part of the ERI Distinguished Lecture for 2020, and I'm honored to have that award, and I thank the ERI board. The full lecture is about an hour, and it's on YouTube. You can find it. But for presentations to chapters like in Southern California, uh, we thought we'd do something different because you're kind of already ahead of the game. So as mentioned, we're going to talk about the... Uh, there it is. We're going to talk about the uh, Resilient Los Angeles report, which some of you may already be available, be uh, familiar with. It's available online. I encourage you to go have a look at it if you don't know about it yet. Even while we're doing this uh, talk today, you can download it and try to keep up. Um, but we'll start with these basic ideas from the lecture, Community Resilience and Functional Recovery. And I'm going to move very quickly. Anything that I look like I'm skipping over, feel free to put a note in the chat or in the questions, and we'll come back to it in the Q&A. So, in 2018, for the first time in federal statute, we have a definition of community resilience. Without going into the details, I want to point out four key ideas that should help us understand what we're talking about when we say resilience. The first is that resilience is not an attribute of buildings or physical infrastructure. It's really an attribute of organizations or social units. So you see that here in the definition where it refers to community. Second is that it's not about safety primarily. It's really more about recovery, hence the term functional recovery, you're going to hear a lot. 
Third is that we're going to measure it in a new way. We're going to measure it over time. Uh, that's what uh, the definition is not clear what it means by being successful, but it means we're going to start using time as a metric. And the fourth idea, of course, this is a NEHRP definition, so it's about seismic events. But in a larger sense, we want to think about resilience to natural hazards. If we're going to measure things in time, then we want to have a starting point in time, and the starting point is a natural hazard event. So how can we take this definition, which is new and useful but still kind of vague to us, how do we relate that to what we do as engineering and, and design? Particularly, if, it, if resilience is not an attribute of buildings, but we design buildings, how can we plug into this idea? And the answer is that we have our own model in engineering already, where we talk about deaths, dollars, downtime is the kind of losses in earthquakes. I like to flip those over. So these are the terms that I like to use, safety, economy, reactivity, recovery. We can predict these in an individual building by being able to predict the damage. We're better than that than ever. If we can add to our damage prediction some information about the use of the building, we can predict this performance of an individual building. But you still don't see here the word resilience, because resilience is not an attribute of the building. So if we can add now information about the organization, the social units, the human uh, organizations, now we can see these new ideas. And one of those is resilience, which is an attribute of an organization. The organization that we're talking about mostly is the community, but it could happen at multiple scales. So here we have my a way of understanding how our engineering can fit into the larger question of resilience. The first thing you see, of course, is that resilience is not just safety plus, it's not just safety times 1.5, it's a different idea entirely because it involves those human social units. But if it is related to the individual buildings, it's less related to safety than it is to reoccupancy and recovery. And the best way to illustrate that from recent experience is from the Christchurch earthquake. You may remember this, 2011, 75% of all the deaths in this event happened in two buildings, yet half of the downtown buildings were red or yellow tagged, and the entire downtown area was cordoned off for more than two years. That's an important recognition, and it tells us that our traditional design path, which was great and served us well for a long time and in California, we have pretty safe buildings because of it, is not really getting us to community resilience. If we want to design for community resilience, we have to have a different design path. We have to shift our focus or add to our focus to be designing for functional recovery. So that's the idea in a nutshell. The goal is not just safe buildings, it's community resilience. If we want to get to community resilience, we have to design for functional recovery. So we have a definition of that now too. This is in a new report uh, by NIST and FEMA and a, a working group, some members of which are on today's panel, including me. And this report is gonna go to Congress, we think any day now, but here's a definition and without reading it, we can now check it again for those four key ideas about resilience. Is it related to natural hazards? Yes. Is it focused on function, not just safety? Yes, it's intending to restore the basic intended functions of a building or infrastructure system. What about the resilience being attributed of, uh, not of buildings, but of organizations? Well, now we're making the shift. So resilience was an attribute of organizations, but this new term, functional recovery, allows us to shift down in the diagram to talk about the design we're doing for an individual building or infrastructure system. So now functional recovery is an attribute of the physical component. What about the idea of time? That's not here in the definition yet because we're gonna have another definition which adds the element of time. So if we define the performance state of functional recovery, now we can say that a functional recovery objective is achieving functional recovery within an acceptable time where, importantly, the acceptable time might differ for different uses of different buildings. So we now have some uh, definitions of community resilience, definitions of functional recovery, off we go. And off we went in this white paper that ERI put out last year, and I'm not going to talk about it now, but I go into quite a bit of detail on this paper and what it's covering and how we're going to advance the idea of functional recovery in the longer lecture, which again, you can find on YouTube. In the longer lecture, then I also focus on talk about eight different things we can do now to advance the idea of functional recovery in our daily work, either as designers, developers, building officials, researchers, policymakers, whoever. And in the lecture I talk about all of them today, I'm going to focus on four only because these are the ones that are focused uh, kind of, these are the, the activities of a local jurisdiction, like a city in Southern California, in particular, like Los Angeles. And again, Los Angeles has these two reports from 2014 and 2018, and we can see how they're doing in these on these four uh, activities. So let's look at those two reports. 
The first one is from 2014. It was called Resilience by Design. Uses the word, it's not really a resilience plan. Why? Because if we can check it against the four key ideas, we find that it's really about the physical objects. This has a lot to say about buildings, a lot to say about water system infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, not really focused in the larger way on resilience, but it's okay, it's a good report. It's trying to do good things, but it doesn't really uh, satisfy the four key ideas about resilience. Nevertheless, there were some goals set, some ideas put forward, and there's some progress that we can now look and see how they're doing after 2014. And here I'm using kind of a color code down at the bottom of the screen. You can see where I'm tracking the different progress for the different ideas in this report. So there were five recommendations made in the building section of this report. Three of them have shown real progress. The first three shown in white. Some of them are lagging behind a little bit or we, we're not sure exactly where they stand, but some progress has been made. And we'll, Henry, of course, will talk about the soft story building program, the largest retrofit program in the history of this country that's ongoing right now in Los Angeles. That's a success that came out of this 2014 report. Craig is gonna talk about some of the good work that's been done on the water system, but you can see again that of the recommendations made in this report, some have moved forward, some seem to be lagging. Here comes the 2018 report, which is gonna go even further. And the first thing to know about it is that it's an executive branch document. So it represents, I would say, I think, some city policy, but it's very much branded to the mayor's office and it came with an executive director a directive shown here, which directs the uh, city agencies to do things, but it didn't really have the city council uh, behind it with money and resources. So that's a question about where it's gonna go as an executive branch document. It's possible that it goes away when Mayor Garcetti leaves office in two years. So we don't know. That, that's one thing to know about this, import, uh, this important report. The other thing to know about it is that it's a product of the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities Program. Los Angeles is one of the first of those 100 cities named in a very interesting and pioneering program, which I support and which I like. But we have to say that Rockefeller has an understanding of resilience that is so expansive, much broader than things we've been talking about so far, that you could almost say that any good idea or the solution to any current problem in a city can somehow be fit into the Rockefeller understanding of what resilience is. And that makes it harder for us to find our way through this very complicated model of city resilience. So that's under, that explains a little bit why the uh, Resilient Los Angeles report looks and feels the way it does. We can check it now against the four key resilience ideas. Does it understand resilience as an attribute of a community? Yeah, it pretty much does. There's some stuff in there about resilient pipes and resilient physical things but that's okay. In large part, it makes the understanding that resilience is an attribute of the community. Does it focus on functionality? It's mixed. There's a lot of stuff in the report about safety, about emergency response, and even about things that aren't related to natural hazards at all. So we have to find our way through to what looks like functionality as we read that report. Does it set clear metrics with regard to time? No, it doesn't. And that's going to be a challenge for us going forward. It's something to build on with this report. And does it focus on natural hazards? The fourth idea, again, it's mixed because of Rockefeller's very expansive idea of resilience is relating to not just natural hazard events, but even to systemic or uh, long-term or everyday stresses in a community. So that gives us a challenge. If we want to understand this report and be part of its progress, we have to find the stuff that's relevant to our work in natural hazards, and particularly in earthquakes, and when I say seek accountability, the executive directive called for regular progress reports. So we as earthquake activists and ad advocates can be looking for those reports and maybe even poking the city uh, uh, departments about where they stand with regard to their performance. One thing we can also offer is to maybe help update the report that does make reference to a number of uh, other documents that actually no longer exist or maybe in some cases didn't ever exist. But back in 2018, they looked like they were going to exist. So they're mentioned in this report. In fact, we need to be, uh, as participants in this process, helping to make sure they have the right information. I'm going to come back to this idea. But the main point is that while I am very supportive of the Rockefeller Group and the Resilient Los Angeles report, we have to acknowledge that in terms of you know, uh, wheels on the ground or boots on the ground, it really is short on metrics. It's short on a mechanism to relate the built environment to the overall resilience of the city. And it's short on actually uh, committing resources to this. So start with finding the relevant stuff that's to us. 
in the report, you will find 96 actions. I'm obviously not going to talk about all of them, or even about the 14 that are specifically about earthquake. The key point here is that there's 96 ways for us to plug in. 38 of them are specifically about natural hazards and earthquakes, so you can find something of interest to everybody. And also importantly, again, that, that when the report came out, it called for regular written reports on the progress of different city departments, so we can track those. A very difficult slide to read, but again, I'm using that kind of color coding to indicate the progress, but not just the progress here, but to look closely at the uh, different actions uh, called for in the report and to separate them by, are they really making serious, talking about serious commitments of resources, or are they more on the advice and encouragement side? So the things that are shown in black are really, even if they were done the way they're written in the report, they're really not something you can put your hands on. They're very uh, encouragement, publicity, outreach, partnering, et cetera, but it's not a commitment of city resources. I mean, you have to acknowledge encouraging somebody to do something voluntarily is a lot different from mandating the retrofit of 16,000 buildings. So they're in these different categories. But I'll call attention to a couple of groups here. The first is that a lot of real progress, and this looks like to be the real bright spot in what came out of these two reports, is the work done particularly on the water system but on the infrastructure side, Craig's gonna talk about that more. And for the structural engineers watching, I mentioned already that we have the soft story mandate and the concrete building mandate. We can talk about that more in the Q&A if you want. Uh, but here in action 61, you will find the city saying that it's going to have more retrofit programs for the city owned buildings, for steel frames and other structure types of interest for private schools and wants to modify or amend the local building code to call for better performance in new buildings. So these things are in the report. It's not clear exactly where they're going and what the commitment of the city will be, but this is a way, particularly for ERI members on the structural side, on the building side, to plug into this report and watch what it's gonna do. So again, here's the other 24 that are not specifically about earthquake, but you can see there's a wide range of encouragement to actual progress that you can put your hands on. In the end, who is tracking the progress on these different things? Well, uh, it's hard to find these reports, so that's part of our challenge is to plug in to the city and prod or work with our colleagues at the city to figure out what's happening. One idea is the, that the mayor already has what he calls a dashboard where he tracks all kinds of things. 20 different things are tracked on this website where, you know, about how the city is doing in terms of public works and uh, related items, including crime and, and uh, other issues. Unfortunately, there are 20 things mentioned, but zero of them are about resilient Los Angeles. So this is one idea that if we wanna be serious about tracking this, the chief resilience officer and the mayor's office could add to their existing dashboard to, sh to share with the public how they're doing on those ideas. So those are the two LA reports. Now back to the ideas from the lecture about four things we can do or four things that local jurisdictions can do related to functional recovery. The first one is resilience-based inventory. So if you think about that action 61, if the city is gonna have more mandatory programs, they're gonna to need to do some inventory. I uh, uh, advise that they should do this inventory in a resilience-based way. Traditionally, when you think about building inventories, we just go out and look at certain bad building types. If it, if to be resilience-based, however, we have to look not only at the building types, not only at the structure types, but at the uses and occupancies. Why? Because one of the key ideas of resilience is about recovery of function. So we have to understand the functions of the different buildings. So with this one page chart, we can make a list down the side of different recovery based functions. We can make a list across the top of the bad building types that we know about, the bad structural types. Importantly, we want to include everything that's also not a particularly bad structure type because we want to get the larger context of where these numbers are going to fall. So for example, if you think about Action 61 in the Resilient Los Angeles report, calls for some kind of program for private schools. So when we do the inventory on that, I submit that when you think about private schools, you should actually think about them together with the public schools into a bigger question of what is gonna happen with our schools after the earthquake. So here we have a row in this matrix, in this resilience-based inventory, and I suggest that doing the inventory should involve filling in these various boxes to get a big picture and a big context of what the overall school sector looks like. Another of the ideas from that Action 61 involved steel frame buildings of certain types. So if we're gonna do that inventory, not only should we count the steel buildings, we should break it out by these different occupancy types, which tend to be in steel frame buildings. 
that makes it a resilience-based inventory. In particular, we may find that, okay, now we're maybe the, there's a big number that happened to be in multifamily residential. So we want to focus on that. That means now we have to put that in context by going back and understanding the whole larger portfolio of multifamily buildings in the city, not just the ones that happen to be steel for a program that's supposed to be about steel. That's what makes an inventory more resilience-based. Second idea, once you have that resilience-based inventory, now you can do real resilience-based planning, which means prioritizing which programs want to come first. Very quickly, there's this NIST resilience, community resilience planning guide. You can find it online for free, of course, and it recommends a format like this for understanding where you want to be and where you are now and identifying the gaps that are going to lead to your needed policy. So down the side, list of facility types or functions across the top of timeline. You can fill in then where you are in the city, that's the blue X on the right, and where you want to be in terms of your recovery. And the gap there tells you this is a high priority. So using this kind of a tool, the CRPG, Community Resilience Planning Guide, is the second thing the city can be doing. Third idea, local code amendment. Each of these organizations, the city, the state of Oregon, even the state of California, to a degree, and even at the federal government for federal buildings is already on record saying, we need to be designing better buildings. What does it mean by better? It means designed for faster functional recovery or for at least predictable functional recovery. While they've all said it, none of them has actually taken a step yet to do it. So now we can add to this list Los Angeles because they're in action 61 is a call for an immediate, immediate occupancy building code. That's really not the right term, but what it's saying is the same idea. New buildings should be designed with an idea about how long it's gonna take for them to functionally recover. So there is nothing right now stopping Los Angeles from getting ahead of San Francisco, once again, by just doing this, because you have this tool already in the building code. It's the assignment of risk category to new buildings, and there is nothing stopping LA from saying, you know, affordable housing or, uh, elderly housing or certain schools or whatever that aren't right now in, rock, in risk category four, we're just going to assign them to risk category four in our building code. You're going to get better buildings, faster recovery without having to wait for a national standard. We want to develop that national standard, but in the interim, you have this tool available to you. And the fourth idea is that just having an overall city recovery plan, which I didn't really see acknowledged in the Missoula LA report, is also important that the city itself has to be ready to change uh, the way it works, not only to respond in an emergency uh, format, but also to be throughout recovery, understand how it's gonna change the roles of city staff and city departments. So those are the four ideas. Here's my last slide again for us as a challenge as earthquake ad, uh, advocates and earthquake safety and resilience advocates to understand this report and to, in the most productive way we can, try to encourage the addition of metrics that the report currently doesn't have, and those should involve reoccupancy time, functional recovery time, service rest restoration time for infrastructure systems. We wanna take the, the ideas in this report and find a mechanism so we can relate the performance of the built environment to the actual measure of community resilience. And the best way to do that, I recommend, is that NIST Community Resilience Planning Guide. That kind of mechanism planning is not yet in the report. And then the third thing, of course, is the money. We need to get the city to commit resources to do it, and some of that is going to be money, but a lot of it is just the kind of executive directors, but also uh, supplemented by legislative mandates and staffing to uh, commit the resources to make this plan happen. Thank you very much. Look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, David, for this very uh, short but quite comprehensive presentation. Uh, lots of questions popped in my mind. Uh, I took some notes <laughs> and I suggest that everyone uh, on, the, on the call, all the attendees, if you have questions, just uh, post them as we go along in the question box in your panel and uh, we will address them in the panel. Our next uh, speaker, I'll now uh, share my screen, um, is going to be uh, Henry Burton, and Henry, uh, five minutes, starting the clock now. All right. Um, so thanks, Christine, and, and uh, thanks, David, for kicking us off with that great talk. Um, and I actually, I actually want to build on something that David uh, just said or, or, or that he highlighted. So he showed sort of these, these four attributes of buildings that, that um, he showed these these four attributes of buildings that 
um, that we can consider to link to resilience. One of them was safety. One of them was recovery. Um, I, I would I would take the perspective of that the safety and recovery are are directly related. Um, um, a, a while back, we worked with social scientists to do a survey to understand um, how the likelihood of homeowners to make the decision to stay in their community after the event, how that would change based on uh, the amount, the, the percentage of buildings in a neighborhood is evacuated. And we actually found that that was actually a significant, had a significant influence on that decision. So what that tells us is that, um, you know, yes, we do want to focus on new buildings and to understand sort of their implication in terms of functional recovery, but we also want to understand our, our vulnerable buildings and, and understand them from the perspective of safety. Because again, if you have a situation where earthquake happens, you have a lot of collapses, regardless of what is happening with the newer building stuff, that is going to influence the recovery. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Los Angeles soft story ordinance for wood frame buildings. Um, just as a little bit of background on the ordinance, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people are already familiar with a lot of it. Um, it mandates the retrofit of wood frame re residential buildings with soft, weak, or open front wall lines. Uh, we call it SWAF buildings. Uh, it's applicable to buildings with at least three units constructed before 1978. And, and uh, you know, owners of these buildings received um, uh, letters from, from, the, from LADBS with the order to comply with the retrofit. And so as part of the work that we've been doing to sort of fought, track this, this particular ordinance and understand the implications, we did a survey of about 25% of the, the 13,000 or so buildings that, it, that, that are affected. And, and we've used that in a number of different studies. Uh, next slide. So one of the things we wanted to do is understand the implications to losses. So we've studied the implications to losses in general, and you'll see that some of that on the next slide. But we wanted to start with collapse losses because we know that, um, again, this ordinance was primarily uh, implemented as a means to um, uh, improving collapse safety. Um, so, so we wanted to start by using collapse losses as as a metric for understanding it. So, so we did a study where, you know, based on our survey, we did, we, we developed some archetype buildings, we developed structural models for those buildings, uh, used them to develop fragility curves, and uh, we looked at, at at a few scenarios to see what what the implication of the ordinance is on collapse losses. And here you can see for a couple of different events that uh, the collapse losses are, are, are significantly reduced. In one case, about 37% reduction, and in another case, about 60% about reduction. Um, you'll notice a, quite a difference between the losses in the 6.8 and 6.4 event. The, re the, the reason for that is just the differences in the, in the, in the distance between the epicenter and the location, the, the central location of the city. Next slide. We also wanted to understand uh, the, the, the cost benefit implications of, of, of the ordinance. So one of the questions that comes up whenever there's an ordinance is how much is this going to cost? Um, uh, does, the, does the cost outweigh the benefit? So we wanted to understand that. So we started at, at, the, at the individual building level and we quantified something called uh, the break-even time. So that would be the time, the, the time point at which the annual cost of the existing building exceeds the upfront cost plus the annual cost of the retrofitted building. And we looked at a few different cases. So for example, we looked at cases where, uh, well, we did consider uh, the presence of an earthquake insurance premium. We, we considered different uh, size premiums ranging from $800 to $5,000. And we saw if you look at the upper two bar charts, we saw that uh, for, for the archetypes that benefited the most from the ordinance, the, the break-even time was on the order of two years. And if you look at the lower two bar charts, those are the ones that benefited the least from the ordinance. The break-even time is more somewhere between uh, 10 to 15 years. Keeping in mind that in terms of, and this is really governed by the, the layout of that first story, um, I would say the inventory is more dominated by buildings that benefit uh, uh, quite well from the, from the ordinance. Next slide. 
We also wanted to understand uh, the, the cost benefit implications on the portfolio scale. So, so looking at the entire uh, 13,000 or so buildings that, that are impacted uh, by the ordinance. So again, using the FEMA P58 methodology as sort of the basis of our assessment, we did a cost benefit analysis at the regional scale. Um, again, we looked at a number of different scenarios. This particular one is for the for the 7.1 hypothetical Puente Hill scenario that's been used in a, in a lot of studies. And the big takeaway here is that, um, you know, the plot on the left, on the right, shows the distribution of cost benefit ratio um, and, and if you look, um, you'll see that the median value is around 0.35, um, which tells us, um, uh, and, well, the mean value is, is the median is 0.35, the mean is about 0.41. So that tells us on average, uh, the benefit to performing the retrofit is on, on the order of two and a half times um, um, the cost of doing the retrofit. Uh, so, so, so that was so that was a that was a, a, a good result that that we were able to find. Um, next slide. So the next so the next thing we wanted to do is is to understand to, to really track the progress on, of the retrofit and 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 try to use models to understand what that means in terms of the reduction of risk over time obviously as the re the retrofit is happening in phases and different buildings are, are going to be retrofitted at different times so uh you have this sort of progressive reduction in risk over time and we wanted to understand we uh, we wanted to track that and so what's shown here so so we got some data from the LADBS um, on on the status of various buildings, there there are sort of three cl classifications for the status. The first one, level one, is where uh, the owner has submitted plans or proof of retrofit. Level two, they've gotten a permit. Level three, the 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 the, the retrofit is completed. Um, and what we found is that roughly 40% of the inventory is retrofitted to date. By the way, the, we, we, we got this database back in August. So when I say to date, we're talking about August to, uh, August 2020. Um, we also found that uh, retrofit progress for condos was slightly slower than that than than was slower than for apartment buildings. So, for example, roughly 30% of condominiums so far have been have been retrofitted relative to about 40% for for apartment buildings. Um, and as you can see from the plot, so this these three graphs show the distribution of the time spent in each of the states based on their current level. So, if we start with the one in on the far right. That's the one where those are the buildings that have already been retrofitted, right? So they're at level three. And the interesting thing there is that you'll see that, which I guess is, is, is to be expected, the time spent actually uh, getting through the retrofit, which is shown by the, the, the blue, I mean, which is shown by the, the green um, uh, histogram is actually skewed to the right. So it takes longer. Now, if we compare, for, for example, the time spent in level two, uh we actually see that for the buildings that are well let's let's look at the time spent in level one for the buildings that are still in level one the time that it takes is about twice that that it took for the buildings that are in level three so meaning the buildings that have been retrofitted already uh the buildings that are not there yet have have have, have taken about twice as long to get through level one right um so that tells us that you know for certain for certain buildings for certain communities that the retrofit is going to be lagging and again obviously that has implications to uh the rate at which you have those reduced losses next slide so this is my last slide um uh, just just want to leave with with talking about a few a few challenges um um so so for example all of the studies we've done have have assumed that the retrofits are being done with uh, ordinary moment frames. Uh, we've actually found that a lot a lot of the retrofits are actually being done with cantilevered columns, um, and so uh, we don't really have a whole lot of information on the likely performance of of, of the buildings with cantilevered columns. Um, and um, you know, there's also the the question of providing too much retrofit strength in the first story, where you push a lot of the damage up in the in the second story. Um, and then there's also some challenges with ensuring uh, that there's an adequate load path and drift compatibility in the different directions. And I should mention, especially uh, for the for the for the second and third challenge, 
a lot of these are being uh, addressed by the existing building, the CIOSC existing, existing building committee. Um, they've, been, they've been working uh, closely with the city of Los Angeles to address, address some of these challenges. So these are not challenges that are being overlooked, um, but, the, but they, you know, they, they're being discussed in, a, in an ongoing manner. And then the last thing we found is that we've actually found that there's actually been slower retrofit progress in, uh, in minority communities. Um, so for example, if you look at, uh, if you look at say uh, the percentage of, of Latinos in a particular community as a metric, we found that the, 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 the rate at which the retrofits are being completed uh, varies by as much as, as much as 10% um depending on on the percentage of, of latinos in a, in a particular community so that's something that 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 we should be paying attention to as well going forward thank you thank you uh, henry very much for these uh, comments uh we're gonna move right along we're running short on time uh the next uh, speaker is gonna be uh sue uh susan doherty Dottie, I, I'm trying to change my, my display while I mention your name, I'm sorry. Susan Dottie, take it away. <laughs> All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's very, very good. Okay. So. Excellent, thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity to join today's panel. Um, I just have two slides, I'm gonna keep it pretty casual, but uh, that's my Twitter account there. And as uh, was mentioned in my introduction, I work for the International Code Council or the ICC. And ICC is the publisher of the codes uh, used here in California, including the building code, uh, the residential code and the existing building code. And also wanted to mention that ICC has its Western regional office right here in Southern California in Brea, and that's where I'm based. And as my role um, as a government relations manager, uh, I work with both code officials, building officials responsible for enforcing the code, as well as designers that use the code. And for much of my career, I've been involved in the code development process, overseeing code changes from the time of their submittal uh, to when they're incorporated into the code and hearing all the testimony along the way. And um, with this experience, I'm sure you can imagine I've heard a number of complaints about the codes. I've heard that uh, they shouldn't be changed so frequently, they're too complex, they make projects unaffordable, and the list goes on. Um, but in the last few years, there's been a growing new complaint, and that is that the code doesn't go far enough with seismic design provisions. Uh, you know, we through the seismic design provisions, the code ensures that occupants will be able to safely evacuate the building in an earthquake, but there's no guarantee that the building will be able to function following an earthquake. Now, I say that with respect to the majority of buildings. Um, there are provisions in the code for higher risk occupancies that provide higher design criteria. Um, and this complaint has been amplified through newspaper articles and social media. And as a result, we're hearing about functional recovery, immediate occupancy, and how the code can change with respect to being functional after an earthquake. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that the complaint is warranted at this time because, uh, like I said, it doesn't apply across the board to all occupancies. Um, and that the code does set forth higher design criteria for high risk buildings, such as those with a large number of occupants and for essential facilities, um, including hospitals, fire stations, police stations. Uh, they're designed for immediate occupancy after an earthquake. And it's also important to understand that the philosophy, the life safety approach used by the code is based on decisions made by the structural engineering community over many, many years. And uh, these provisions are considering societal needs and also economic considerations. Uh, the structural engineering community has been involved in the development of seismic provisions uh, since before the first international building code came out in the year 2000. They've submitted changes to reflect new technical standards and lessons learned from earthquakes. They have been very active and taken us to where we are today. 
but if the time has come to change this design approach, there's a system in place to do that. Uh, building codes are revised every three years with the most recent addition being the 2021 20, codes, which are available now, and the next edition being the 2024 codes. And I wanna say that the code change process is open to anyone and everyone except for ICC employees. So uh, we don't write the code, ICC doesn't write the code. Uh, ICC is a facilitator in making changes to the code. And um, when people say that the code doesn't go far enough, uh, I remind them that the code is an absolute minimum and you can always do more. And I, I do wanna share that from my experience, there are users of the code that I find very focused on how to beat the code, how to find the loopholes and how to find ways to circumvent the minimum requirements rather than to view it as a minimum and look for ways to do more. So after all of that, and after emphatically saying that ICC doesn't write the code, I do wanna say that ICC has been paying close attention to the conversation and has been very involved at the national level on seismic functional recovery uh, initiatives. Um, last year, ICC and the California building officials hosted a seismic roundtable in Sacramento to facilitate communication between different organizations and representatives on the subject of seismic functional recovery for new construction. Um, this event was videotaped and a report was issued. Uh, we identified different pathways to achieve functional recovery. A visual roadmap was drawn that graphically depicted the pathways with timelines. And as far as pathways using building codes, uh, three were identified. And the one with the shortest timeline can be accomplished by the 2024 codes. Uh, we followed up with a next steps forum that was conducted a few months after the seismic roundtable with a report identifying the next steps. And one of those steps was to create a seismic portal on ICC's website to house all relevant information for those, there we go, we have the new slide, um, with, with all the uh, functional recovery material you can possibly imagine. Um, David referred to his YouTube video that's posted on there. Uh, the videos taken from the seismic round table are on there and um, the, the visual roadmaps there. there. There's so much there. I invite you to go there. It is intended to serve as a mechanism to engage all of us to talk more about it and uh, take up one of those paths. So um, thank you, Susan. I was this, okay. I know. I'm sorry. Are, are you done? I, <laughs> oh, I was just. I was just. I guess we're running short on time. So yeah. Um, I was. Yeah. I was just going to mention about 2018 Resilient Los Angeles and how I would love to have seen functional recovery specifically addressed, um, but uh, we're not quite there yet. So I'll end it there. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share these comments. Thank you, Susan, for, for helping us stay on time with those brief uh, remarks. And uh, we'll have our next uh, speaker, Craig, for the last bits of remarks on the water infrastructure resilience. And your time starts now. Okay, thank you, uh, everybody. So I'll start with uh, acknowledging David's great presentation and how impressed I am for a Northern California person to actually understand in such great detail the, the planning for resilience in Southern California. I was quite impressed with that. What I'm going to do is talk about water infrastructure, much of it uh, uh, and very specifically applied to resilience by design and resilient Los Angeles, and what uh, I was able to help the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power do as related, and David highlighted that. But a lot of this stuff deals with the greater concepts of other infrastructure, it's applicable uh, across boards to certain degrees, and would be happy to address questions related to broader infrastructure and lifeline-related uh, systems um, in, in the uh, uh, question and answer part. So first, I wanna point out that DWP created uh, the first departmental chief resilience officer, actually, and that was me. I called myself the resilience program manager back in 2014 which in Resilient Los Angeles, uh, all departments uh, took that model 
and um, created departmental chief resilience officers, which remain active, which is great. Um, in 2014, we created a water system resilience plan, which was the basis for creating a never ending program and continually implementing that. Um, uh, part of resilience by design identified to fortify Los Angeles water supply against seismic hazards. Uh, that really intended to focus first and foremost on the issues of crossing the uh, San Andreas Fault. And um, related to that, uh, Los Angeles is not the only water supplier for Southern California. There are multiple uh, agencies that do that, LADWP, the Metropolitan Water District, and the Department of Water Resources. So to help address all of that, we created a Seismic Resilient Water Supply Task Force, which remains active, and uh, that the idea is for them to work together uh at not as three separate units for three different aqueduct systems but to think about those as regional water supply systems uh a, a regional water supply system and that we should all act together rather than individually uh, after a major san andreas earthquake and there are plans being implemented for that uh another issue is uh that we worked hard on and actually was in the news today i think it was on abc about creating a seismic resilient pipe network what that is, is the development of seismic resilient pipes, those pipes that can withstand earthquake effects, uh, to lay out a grid for which uh, we would have reliable pipes that can supply water, but it's not replacing all pipes. It's, to, it's, it's not trying to create a resistant network, but it's a uh, resilient network that can sustain damage, but yet provide water services to the customers when they need it. So in that concept, it's related directly to what David presented in that the, the network, the water network or the water system is only there to support the resilience of the community itself. It's, it's, it's so, so you can't talk about a water resilient network without having uh, incorporating the resilience of LA. Um, and then we de developed fire following earthquake plans and implementing them by uh, int intimately working with the LA fire department uh, that uh, part of that relates back into how we create a seismic resilient pipe network. Um, and we have established performance targets and recovery times for basic services. So I'd like to make one minor correction to what David said. There is one metric in at least one metric in uh, resilient Los Angeles, and that is to establish performance criteria by all systems, all departments. Uh, the concern I have with that is that it takes, they allow, I think it is 10 years to do that. Uh, LADWP did that within six months after Resilient Los Angeles came about, and that led to developing a performance-based seismic design policy, which is embedded in the LA water system, and there's a lot behind that, but it, it's where the performance targets and recovery of services uh, by a time frame are, are established. So with that, I'm just going to uh, leave that quick summary there, and hopefully that prompts a lot of questions, and I'll stop about 20 seconds short for you. I think this is a record. You've done fantastic, Craig. <laughs> so thank you so much. So at this point, uh, we're going to move into the the, the panel Q and A. We've had a lot of uh, very good, uh, thoughtful presentations on different topics. I want to remind you that uh, you can go on your question panes. You click on the little arrow on the left of questions, and that's where you can type in your questions and we will uh, we will go over them um, as we go into the panel. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, right now, and uh, I think we can bring all the panelists' uh, cameras on, and uh, we will start the panel discussion. So uh, I'd like to start with a, a general question here, and then we'll we'll go through uh, more specifics there. So for all of you, I'd like to get all your different perspective on this. So how can we really afford to do this resilience and functional recovery as part of the design, right? So uh, starting maybe with David, uh, I mean, isn't that kind of super costly does it make sense you mentioned to have more uh, uh building category four do we need to design everything as a hospital and how can we finance that so let's start with david and then we'll go around 
It's a, thank you. It's a very common question. Obviously, it's the first question most people ask when you put a new idea forward is how much is it going to cost? So a couple of things to know. One, the whole idea of functional recovery is that not every building has to respond like a hospital. We can have an acceptable recovery time that's maybe on the order of days, weeks, maybe even months for some low-use buildings. And so not every building has to be as good as a hospital or a fire station, et cetera. Uh, the other thing to note is that some buildings already achieve these goals, that the building code actually gives us pretty good buildings in a lot of cases. We just don't know it because we don't talk about their performance in terms of recovery time. So one advantage of moving the design strategy to functional recovery is it gives us new terminology we can use. It changes the terms of performance so we have a better understanding of where we are, even for a code design building today. And if we're achieving acceptable recovery time with that, that's a zero cost premium. Otherwise, we need more research to try to you know, sort out what the actual costs are gonna be. But the studies that have been done uh, for buildings that have voluntarily done some of this work or have intentionally studied it, have shown you can achieve much better performance. You can achieve basically risk category four effectively identical performance for a zero to 2% initial cost premium. So those are case studies, they're anecdotal, but there are lots of examples. There's a growing number of examples that uh, show that the expected cost premium is much smaller than you might think. So I'd like now to pass that to Craig. I mean, uh, it's a bit different when you're a city agency. That's not part of your budget. How do you how do you handle and finance that? Want to say a few words on that? Yeah. So um, thank you, Christine. That's a great question. In fact, that's one of the first questions that I had to address inside of DWP. Uh, and I don't believe any of the managers believe this anymore. But in 2014, when Resilience by Design was coming out. We work closely and the many statements from higher level management inside the water system was, I don't want to address this, we can't afford it because there's a lot of pressures on, on the system as well as any lifeline organization. Uh, where do you spend your money and how do you prioritize that? But so to get through that, I, I, I addressed many topics. Uh, one, it was that you have to understand that resilience doesn't actually cost anything. It doesn't have to cost anything. There's some activities that have no net cost. You could just do them. I can give plenty of examples and I'll save the time for that now, but we can come back to it if we want. There are, um, I, I could give proof and I have examples of how implementing resilience and putting resilience thinking actually saved money to a project, to projects, not just a single one that was had to take place anyway. So resilience can actually save money. Uh, unfortunately, you could rarely take that money that you saved and apply it to another resilience project. They usually go to a different uh, priority, but you can save money. Some have little costs, things that you can't actually afford. And then some things do cost a lot. Uh, an example of that is how do you deal with the aqueduct crossing, the San Andreas Fault in our Elizabeth Tunnel that could move uh, 20 to 30 feet, right? It's a nine foot wide tunnel. Well, that could be billions of dollars, at least hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but is it cost effective? Well, yes, it is, because if you have no water because of that, Los Angeles only exists because we brought water here. So Los Angeles would cease to exist if you don't deal with this water issue and, and make sure that you can get that water restored in a, in a timely manner. So the idea is that we shouldn't automatically assume we can't afford resilience. In fact, I would say when you account for the losses after an event, um, you might end up concluding that we can't afford not to be resilient, right? Mitigation has shown to be very cost effective. Uh, and so the main point I would like, I, I like to present on this is that um, we should all prepare resilience programs and figure out what needs to be done before we begin to conclude we can't afford it. And if it's really important, like ensuring we get water across the San Andreas Fault, let's ask the community. An engineer shouldn't decide that the community <laughs> can't afford it. Maybe the community is willing to pay an extra penny per billing per, you know, for 20 years, right? And, and that could pay for it, right? Stuff like that. So, so that's the idea. We need to figure out what we need to do before we conclude we can't afford it. But it is a common misnomer that we can't afford it. So I'd like Thank to break you. that. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, Henry, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I can say a little bit. I think I think David and, and Craig pretty much covered it. I, I would say 
you know, so, so, so Craig started talking about the, the benefits and the fact that, you know, we, we should look, be looking at it as we can afford not to. So, so, so maybe one of the things is we as, uh, as a community, meaning a community of engineers, of structural engineers, maybe we need to uh, get better at telling those stories of what those benefits are, right? Because we know the benefits happen at different tiers, right? So, so, so if you're talking about buildings, uh, uh, Craig mentioned sort of the reduced cost of having to repair and replace things after an earthquake, right? That's, that's, that's one sort of immediate benefit. There's also the benefit of a lot of these buildings are revenue generators. Right, the, the, these these buildings are places where a lot of economic activity occurs. So there's sort of an indirect there's an indirect cost of not being able to use your building over a period of time that you have to account for. So that's another tier. And then and then there's another another tier that's a little bit less. It's it's harder to sort of quantify at least in terms of dollars. But you know these are these buildings are places where you know where our kids go to learn. Um, these are places where, um, you know, we manage our emergency response. Um, so these, these are places that, it, that support the community in general. So I think, you know, like I said before, maybe it's just a question of getting better at, at talking about the benefits at the different levels. Thank you. And Susan? Yeah, I would just echo everything that has already been said and note that when a code change is submitted, uh, the cost impact needs to be identified. And just recently, uh, we have been charged with developing a methodology to do that for future code changes, because this is absolutely the first question that comes up when looking at adding provisions to the code for functional recovery. Thank you very much. So we have a few questions that are kind of follow-ups and, and, and from different people uh, online. Uh, so uh, yeah, Craig, uh, question is the, the performance-based uh, seismic design doc you mentioned, the last item on your bullets, is that available somewhere? Is that something that can be shared? Uh, um, when I retired a year and a half ago, it was supposedly in process of being put on the DWP website. Okay. I cannot yeah. confirm if it's there. I do not okay. know that it is, and I suspect that it actually might not be. Uh, so if anybody okay. from DWP is listening, maybe you can talk uh, amongst yourselves to make sure that that actually is put online. But it is it is available. It can be provided to people if you're interested. And um, if you know how to get a hold of me, uh, feel free to inquire and I can send a copy of that or inquire through the LA Department of Water and Power. Good. Uh, so there was a question for David. So one of your slides showed a flowchart with damage on the bottom, vitality, uh, stability and resilience on the top. So the question is, is he suggesting that vitality and stability are distinct attributes from resilience? Why? Why not have the entire top row simply be resilience? Well, this is uh, uh, those are not my terms. Uh, the model uh, and the diamond shape of it is my model to help me make sense of where our engineering fits in. But that's an important point that when we start talking about resilience as earthquake engineers or as structural engineers, we got to recognize that we're coming to this kind of late. There's a long history of resilience uh, research from the uh, environmental community, from psychology, from economics. That, and they, for you know, 20 years or more, have started establishing the terminology. So we can't just redefine the words the way we want. So the idea of vitality is actually out there in the psychological literature and in the public health literature. Uh, so I'm, I didn't make up those terms, uh, but I'm trying to, and I, and I can't say that I fully understand them the way they're used in the academic world either. I'm just trying to understand how we fit in uh, with the work that we're doing and how we how the word resilience, as it's been defined in a dozen different uh, by a dozen, dozen different documents and organizations over the last 20 years, understands what that means. And what it means is it's primarily related to the re recovery of functionality. And and yet yeah, the community concept through those attributes is very important. And I think well, so. This brings the, 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 yeah. what, yeah. and one thing, and I showed kind of a snowman-like diagram from the Resilient LA report, and I like that diagram because it points out that resilience happens at different scales. So even when we talk about resilience not being an attribute of the building, but of being an attribute of a social unit, there are social units at different scales. 
So the LA report, in fact, talks about the household, the neighborhood, the city, and then the region or even the state or country. So I'd like to follow up on this. And so it's interesting, we're all engineers. This is the ERI chapter. So we think as engineers, this problem is not something that engineers will solve, as some of you have mentioned, but we're part of the, the solution and maybe the problem as well. But how can we better fit and what is the holistic approach and where is the role of the engineers and this community that is joined us here? How can we really contribute and be part of the solution in the more global view that, for example, Dave, you presented? That's not just, oh, the engineer does one building at a time or just even a single infrastructure at a time. So how I'd like to hear your views on how we can do a better job in fitting in the holistic approach. So and who wants I, to be I, first? <laughs> I have a lot of ideas about that, but I've talked the most already. So if somebody else wants to jump in. I, I, I'm happy to kick it off. So um, we need to work beyond engineering. Uh, we need to think about everything in a systems approach. Resilience is a systemic concept. It is not a component concept. Uh, so if we're building structures, we need to think about you know, medical structures, hospitals, and all the support to that, not just a hospital, but there's clinics and a whole system there, and how one privately owned hospital applies and interacts with another privately owned hospital, right? So it's it, it, they all form a medical system, as an example. All the fire stations throughout Southern California, even outside of the city of Los Angeles, LA County as a whole, it, whether it's a county, city, or it, you know, um, any city, they all work together. The water system, we're not designing, we shouldn't be designing an individual pipe or just a supply system or just a treatment system or just a distribution system or just a transmission system. We need all of them, but we need them all to work together. And, and so we need to develop processes to understand what are, to achieve these recovery goals that we've been talking about. So we need to establish recovery goals and create systems that actually are designed to meet those goals. So the design part is where the engineer comes in. The goal part is not an engineering concept. It has to come from the community itself. So we have to work with the community and we can't as engineers say, okay, that's what I designed, that's what they get. That's a failure. Right, but that is essentially how we've moved in the historically. So David, do you want to add to that? Yeah, because I want to agree with all that. The first part of what Craig said there was uh, um, the challenging part, because to go back to your question, if an individual engineer tries to do that, it just makes your head explode. Everything's connected to everything else and you can never make any progress. But that's why that idea of finding the mechanism that relates the facility specific technical work that we do on individual projects to a larger goal is a planning process to be done by others. Most engineers don't even know exactly what the building code gives them in terms of safety in the current code, okay? That's fine because we wrote the code knowing that when applied, it will give us a result that we want. And we have to do the same thing now as we shift to a new level of codes, a new level of planning documents, that those are the documents that we have to have a good development of those so that we can trust that when applied, by individual through individual project at a small fine level the aggregate effect will achieve the goal we want it's not for the individual engineer to try to figure out everything before they even begin that just uh, you know it, it 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 just handcuffs you so psychologically we we need to understand that the engineer is going to continue to work on individual projects for individual developers as long as we write the guidelines the codes the policy to make to, to channel them in the right direction we will get the right aggregate effect thank you andrew you looked eager to add to that. Are you um, still eager? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, I, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to add. I think, well, I think Craig sort of, sort of articulated what, what I was thinking, which is that, you know, the questions, the goals of a particular community shouldn't be coming from the engineers. Now, engineers are members of a community, so there's no reason they can't be a part of the conversation, but they, you know, they shouldn't be the ones 
leading that conversation, right? I mean, even from, I'm an academic, even from an academic perspective, sort of the questions need to come from people who sort of study how society works, how communities function, how these different uh, uh, community surfaces interact. And then it's our job to say, okay, based on this particular performance implication, this is what we're looking at in terms of recovery, in terms of reoccupancy. And then, okay, you take that and, 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 and figure out how does that fit into the larger picture? Thank you. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Susan, do you want to chime in? Sure. Yes. You know, I work with uh, code officials, building officials, and so we're definitely focused on buildings, but we are <clears throat> asking them to work with their emergency management team and to look at the emergency plan and to coordinate with the other departments on how to respond to emergencies. And there are grants available to building departments through the California Office of Emergency Services where they can do, uh, they can receive money to um, start up retrofit programs. So there are small ways and small things that we can all do within our circles to create a safer community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good, good thoughts here. We we have about uh, eh, ten minutes, a little bit less than ten minutes in this panel discussion. I'm still screening the questions for things that are relevant for for the whole perspective. So I'll leave out the specific detailed questions about one type of building and so on. I don't think that's the focus of this discussion. We're talking, trying to be more global. So I'm letting no people people who ask those questions that we might not be able to address them all. But uh, again, the one thing we didn't mention is the speakers will be given those questions and they, they may respond to you uh, after the fact uh, on an individual basis. So um, I, I wanted to dra draw something uh, uh, from, uh, from David uh, in your longer lecture uh, that we didn't have the chance to hear today. You talk about leaders and followers. And uh, I think this is kind of uh, very important. Uh, and uh, what can you tell us about that and, and, and how we, we can be uh, hopefully more leaders than just followers or good followers? <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. Well, good, that, that's right. That's not to be denigrating at all. It's to say no. that there are rules. And in fact, where that idea came from is recognizing that um, you know you can't do everything and that as you, you know this big holistic idea is not something that we can all plug into and that just in my work with cities recognizing that cities don't respond to reports that we write so eri writes a white paper no city is going to just pick up that white paper and do it what they do do is they look at what their peers are doing they respond to what their colleagues are doing so uh, you know and if you think about the city of los angeles uh the water department is way ahead but there's this executive directive that tells the other departments are supposed to be doing it. As I quipped yesterday, you know, you can lead a horse to the water department, but you can't make it drink. <laughs> so we don't know what they're going to do. We have to put a little bit of pressure on. So, but there are leaders and there are followers at all levels, not just at cities, but developers, engineers. In the longer lecture, I give four examples of engineers who happen to work with their clients who were enlightened and about this idea and had this, and they wanted their engineer to, to do more than code. So they did it. So there's good examples out there to do that. Uh, it's a lot easier to be a follower. Followers only exist because there are leaders to follow by definition. So we need those leaders out there setting the best practices, making presentations, writing conference papers, et cetera. And the followers will, they will arise. They will see the good idea and they will follow that. It's okay to be a follower. It's easier to be a follower. I actually recommend being a follower to a lot of the smaller cities. Easier. Just don't follow, just don't follow blindly right? Because, for example, look at the soft story program. LA has a soft story program for 13,000 buildings, and now a lot of little cities around the Los Angeles area also are interested in this soft story program. Same thing happened in the Bay Area, which is great if you actually have a soft story problem in your community. If you have a, nothing but single-family houses, why are you worried about a soft story program? And the problem is that they're, they're, well, everybody else is doing it, so we ought to do it. So we, as the experts, ought to be able to advise those communities about the right way to be a follower etc. Another Good. example I mentioned about the code amendment, don't wait for the state, don't wait for the feds. If it's in your city policy, do it and ERI Southern California, you get out there and call for it. 
that's all of us. Okay, good. Th well, uh, David, you know, we, you're friends of the chapter. It's all good. <laughs> okay, I'd like, so we have just a few minutes and I'd like to hear each of you, you guys' point of view. And we talked a lot about, you know, some of the hurdles and whatnot and what's done, what's not done. What are the next steps? What, what can we do in a more concrete fashion to move forward for a better resilience? So who wants to start on this? I'd like to point to Susan. You mentioned something that we can all have an impact on the building code. And that's, you know, and we need to be engaged and not just think that something that happens from top above and the ICC is not actually developing it, but facilitating. So maybe that, that's one thing uh, where, where everybody can, can try to contribute. So you want to say a few words about that? Sure, yes. Um, so the code change process is such that you have an opportunity once every three years to submit a code change, and that's coming up January 2022 for the structural provisions. So we've got a year to get together, find a champion, submit something if we wanna go forward. It can be an appendix chapter. An appendix chapter in the building code is optional. So if a jurisdiction decides to adopt that appendix, then it's only then that it is effective. So there are some ways to ease into the code and uh, definitely wanted to flag that code change deadline for the 2024 codes. And also I mentioned the next steps forum that we had that talked about what are the next steps when it comes to functional recovery. And I, had, I have them written down. The only one that we have done is the seismic functional recovery portal on the ICC website. So anybody can submit to me what they'd like to see on that website. But we had a number of other things such as functional recovery terminology defined. And David, you defined some of that, but I think there's more that can be done and a messaging to get it out there. We had messaging, making the case for functional recovery. Functional recovery matrix, use versus recovery time. I think we're at that stage where we can share that. Create an engagement plan, develop incentive options, provide cost benefit analysis, uh, create a public seismic portal, which we did, and form an official functional recovery coalition. You know, we were going to go forward with those, all of those steps, but we have this FEMA NIST functional recovery options paper or report to Congress that we're waiting to come out. It's, it, it, it was submitted in June and yet it hasn't been released yet. So, and, and David and I and Craig all served on that uh, writing of the report and we're waiting anxiously to have that report come out. I think once that report's out, we'll be able to go forward with a number of these other next steps. Now with that, I think others yeah. will have something to say. Yeah, and I am also trying to see how we can engage uh, the, the attendees in, in these activities. So Henry, you wanna go next? Yeah, yeah, I'll go. I'll, I'll give my my perspective as as an academic or more so as, as a teacher. I'm, I'm lucky to be, I offer a class on, on performance based earthquake engineering uh, at the graduate level and I, I make sure and use it as an opportunity to expose um, expose students to this this idea of resilience and how it fits into performance based engineering. And we, we also talk about about recovery. And I think one of the things that I'm seeing is that, you know, especially for the younger generation, they're really passionate about wanting to have an impact on the broader society. And I think linking what we do to this idea of, a res of resilience is an opportunity to do that. Um, I talk about the fact that, you know, um, sort of the evolution of structural engineering is kind of like structural engineers opening, opening up the conversation that they're, have, that they're having, right? So, so we started by just talking in terms of EDP, so we can only talk to each other. And we started talking in terms of, okay, um, um, immediate occupancy. So we started using words that are more familiar to building owners. And now we're talking about community recovery, right? So it's, it's this broader discussion with society that we're having. And I think that's really exciting for, for young structural engineering students. Thank you, Craig. Next steps. So maybe LEWP kind of uh, set the stage as a leader. How will we make the other ones follow and actually do things, not just follow the, the organization? You know, wanna, or maybe have other ideas. I, I, I don't wanna. To, uh, I needed to unmute. Sorry about yes, that. Yes, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, well, I, I got a whole list, and, and some of which um, were already mentioned because they're in this NIST FEMA functional recovery work. And I could just pop those off, but I'll, I'll focus on what I think is the most important part because it relates to your question of how do we get others, uh, other water systems and all other lifeline systems uh, to work together because we actually need them all to work together. And to do that, and 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 not only work together because they're interdependent, but to provide the users, which uh, from a structural engineer's perspective would be the buildings, although there's more users than just buildings for lifelines, um, that, that all has to be consistent. We can't be doing this independent. So LADWP can't decide what it's gonna do for its water services. And then uh, on the power side, they decide something different that's inconsistent for power and so the Cal Gas do something very independent and LADOT do something very independent because maybe we need a bridge to recover the water, right? And, and, and so to do that, we need to create a functional recovery framework um, that, that is applicable across the city. And in fact, it needs to be applicable across all of Southern California. And not only that, it actually needs to be applicable across the entire state and, and truly uh, essentially across the entire country. So we need to establish in that framework, what are these functional recovery goals and how do they all apply to be consistent so that you can serve the community and get the users the services that they need when they need them. And for uh, a discussion that we would have in the functional recovery work would be that a hospital certainly needs uh, water and power and electric, you know, and, and gas services and transportation services before a bowling alley. Right. Thank so, you, Craig. So this is the I, idea. I have to leave 15 seconds for David to provide <laughs> his summary punchline because we have then closing comments. Go, go read the white. Go read the white paper that's on the ERI website. It actually talks about ways to get involved without having your head explode because everything has to be related to everything else. Um, I want to be optimistic. Action 61, resilience-based inventory, those are great chapter activities. Uh, be wary about the buzzwords. You cannot open an engineering magazine anymore without seeing the word resilience. And a lot of it is not what we're talking about. So just be wary. Educate yourselves watching the, the videos like this uh, and reading the, re the reports that we've referred to. The real challenge is going to be the economy. That's going to be tough. We know that in California, there's going to be more emphasis before they get to earthquakes on fire and pandemic. That's okay. We can plug into that too, as long as they have a, uh, a good idea, a proper understanding of resilience. That kind of work is something that we can be part of and support as well, recognizing that it's going to come back to help us because we'll be developing the idea in the broader sense. Great. Thank you so much. Concise summary. I'd like to thank our whole panel and before uh, everybody, I mean, fantastic. And I, as I told them before, you could all have had your own two, three hour full day webinar <laughs> presentation. We did that as a panel to have a little bit more discussion and interactions. And, and I thank you all for your time. Uh, we were very lucky uh, to have you. For the closing comments, I would like to invite Mark Bentian. He's the Associate Director for Communication, Education and Outreach at SCEC, the Southern California Quake Center. And he's also the Secretary Treasurer of the, the Southern California uh, ERI chapter. So I'm going to share my screen and you should be able to... Do you see the slide, Mark? I do. Great. Thank you. Go Hi, ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Very quickly, just want to let everybody know that professional development hour forms, uh, the survey and the recording will be shared with all attendees by tomorrow. Uh, you may even get a link to it immediately after the end here to the survey. Please complete that survey that really does inform decisions about our future events. Um, if you're not an EERI member, you can learn more at the website shown, eeri.org, and there will be more info in the email too. There's also a younger members committee if you're new in your career. Uh, to find out about upcoming other EERI webinars, you can check out the EERI Pulse newsletter and find that on the EERI website or as you've seen on the screen too. And then really, EERI SoCal is rebuilding and we, we really are looking to organize more activities like today's webinar and others. So if you have suggestions for such activities, ways we can continue the conversation from today, um, any questions, 
or would like to be added to our regional email list, please email SoCal at eeri.org. And then finally, we'd like to thank FEMA for supporting this webinar through their support to EERI. Thank you. So this concludes our webinar. Thank you, everyone, and you have a great day.